Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Welcome to the RIA Edge podcast. This is Mark Bruno, Managing Director and Head of the Wealth Management Group at Informa. And we are very much looking forward to having one of our first discussions here today about asset management on RIA Edge. As all of our listeners know, we talk about M&A, we talk about organic growth strategies and really try and arm our listeners here with strategies for how they can accelerate the growth of their business. But given where we are today in the markets and the economy, we felt like we really needed to have a conversation about asset management and how RIAs can take perhaps a slightly different approach to managing client money to not only deepen relationships with their existing clients, but to obviously increase the number of clients and expand in the high net worth and ultra high net worth markets. And I could not think of a better person to offer their thoughts on this than our special guest here today, David Levi, managing partner at Brookfield, head of Brookfield Oak Tree Wealth Solutions and CEO of Brookfield's Public Securities Group. David, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Mark. Really excited to join you. It, and the, the timing is really perfect. I have to say, David, over the last several weeks and on the last two episodes of uh, RIA Edge, the subject of alternatives has come up you know, several times. Um, we were just talking with Michael Tiedemann last week from Alti, um, and he was talking about you know, their approach, not just as an RIA, but as an alternative investment provider and how much traction alts are gaining with you know, some of the fastest growing and most thoughtful RIAs out there. So I'm really excited to get your thoughts and hear what you're seeing out on the field. But before we do, when I briefly introduced you, I, you had three separate titles. Right, yeah. So I think we have to start with an overview of your role and a little bit of a background on you know, the history of how Brookfield and Oak Tree came together to support the FA and the RIA market. Absolutely. Yeah, as, as you introduced me, Mark, I thought the same thing. That was a, yeah, a mouthful. So um, happy to happy to explain it. So I, I, I have really two different roles within within Brookfield. One is I'm the CEO of Brookfield's Public Securities Group. That, that is a business that is wholly focused on uh, providing liquid solutions. So um, solutions that, that offer generally daily liquidity um, to investors around the world. These could be institutional investors, they could be uh, intermediaries, uh, financial advisors, RAs and the like. Um, we do that in uh, generally real asset related strategies. So this could be liquid or listed real estate, uh, listed infrastructure strategies, uh, renewable strategies, uh, more multi-asset, real asset related strategies. And, and um, that business has been around for, for uh, several decades and, and really is a, a leader in liquid real assets. The second job that I have uh, is, is the head of what we call Brookfield Oak Tree Wealth Solutions. Um, this is a business wholly dedicated to delivering our institutional caliber services across both Brookfield and Oak Tree to uh, financial advisors, financial intermediaries, again, whether they be RAAs, financial advisors at, at banks or private banks around the world. We have a team of people that are really responsible for servicing and supporting uh, the financial advisor community. And, and specifically, um, we have a dedicated team focused on RIAs in the US. And, and um, I can talk a, a bit more detail in a few minutes, but, but suffice it to say, what we offer at Brookfield Oak Tree Wealth Solutions is the range of institutional caliber products that, that Brookfield and Oak Tree uh, offer to, to institutions, again, now to individual investors via financial intermedi intermediaries. And this ranges from real asset related products like real estate or infrastructure to uh, private equity products like special situations and um, more uh, core private equity 
to credit products um, as well. And you, you probably know Oak Tree as um, the preeminent credit uh, investor in the world, Howard Marks and, and whatnot as, as co-founder, have been doing this for a long time, excellent at navigating credit markets. Brookfield is the leader in real asset investing. Um, we've been doing that for well over a hundred years. And, and in 2019, Brookfield bought a majority of Oak Tree Capital left the uh, business independent and, and from an investment perspective, Oak Tree runs exactly as it did previously. The wealth business is really one of the only places, in fact, the only place uh, where, where we combine our efforts and have one business dedicated to what we do across both Brookfield and Oak Tree. Beautiful. And thank you for the table setter. I appreciate it. I think it gives our audience a good context for you know, your perspective and your point of view as we talk about some of the challenges, but also opportunities in the RA marketplace. Um, so maybe we can start there. You know, it, it's March 2023. I think about where we were 12 months ago. We were in a very different place. Um, 2022 was one of the most challenging markets advisors and their clients have experienced in a really long time. Um, so given where we are now, that lack of you know, just you know, basic market appreciation, um, the lack of growth, the increased volatility, and still more than anything, the uncertainty, right? How much longer will we be operating in a market environment like this? And how much deeper, right? If there are losses, might they go? So I'd love to just get your take. One, where are we now? And as you look at some of the challenges that are also opportunities for RIAs, what comes to the top of the list? Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's um, it, it, as you point out, going back a, a year ago to where we are today, uh, massively different. Uh, and and our, our, our perspective in terms of where are we in that, in that cycle, um, look, I think our, our, our perspective is we, we still have some, some room to run, so to speak, in terms of volatility, in terms of uncertainty. Are we toward the end of, of the rate cycle that we're in right now? Maybe, but, uh, but, but uncertainty, uncertainty will certainly prevail um, for a long time. And, and um, so what, is, what does that mean uh, as, as, uh, as an RIA? What does that mean for what you could do uh, with your clients and your clients' portfolios to protect them with this uncertainty? And how do you, how do you keep people invested, uh, which presumably is, is a challenge in, in these um, in these times, uh, our perspective is that uh, it is the perfect time for alternatives. And you know, you think about the way institutional investors allocate their capital uh, around the world, and you could look at different numbers and different statistics. But um, but anywhere from fifteen to thirty five to 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 north of that percent of their portfolios are allocated to various types of alternatives. If you look at individual investors, and again, it depends on the study and it depends on the lo locale and, and whatnot, that number is closer to 3%. So most of the partners that we work with, whether they be RIAs, banks, private banks, wealth managers, et cetera, are focused on increasing their clients' allocation to, to alternatives. And, and the reason is, is relatively simple. It's, it's good for clients. And you know the, the type of alternative has to be right has to fit in the portfolio the right way. The, the education around liquidity is incredibly important, but what do alternatives do? They act as a diversifier. They provide lower volatility than, than broad markets. And they tend to provide, depending on the type of, of alternative we're talking about, uh, a stable stream of income. And so in, in a market like this, and I could get into more details about all the benefits. And again, it really depends on the type. But in a market like this, where you have volatility, you have kind of correlation of one between credit markets and equity markets, as we saw last year, what, what do you want? You, you want a diversifier and you want something that's going to be a quote unquote alternative to more traditional equity or credit portfolios. And, um, and that's where we come in. Um, so, you know, for, from, from our perspective, Right now, in this in this kind of macro backdrop, as as an RIA is somebody that's uh, advising clients, adding diversifiers into their portfolios is is an obvious good step. Doing it in a way that um, meets the client's objectives in terms of in terms of liquidity requirements, cash flow, immediate cash flow needs, um, and the like is is important. Which is which is um, you know part part of the reason education is so important as well. 
Yeah, and I do want to touch on that because I think there are so many interesting dynamics. I mean, obviously, alternatives have been around for a while, more so in the institutional space than in the individual space, as you noted. Uh, but given the, the market that we're in right now, you mentioned diversification is obviously a primary driver, but there's so much more right than just diversifying. Um, you talked about liquidity and so on and so forth. When you're having conversations with advisors right now, and they're interested in learning more about you know, your real estate offerings or your infrastructure or credit offerings, what specific problems are you finding that they're trying to solve for on behalf of their clients right now? Mm -hmm. A few things. One, especially with all of uh, the, the, the press and the, and the reality, of course, of an inflationary environment, one thing that clients are very focused on is how do I protect my assets from inflation? And alternatives, certain types of alternatives, and I'll keep, I'll keep saying that because we as an ind industry tend to um, paint this, this asset class with one monolithic brush. Um, alternatives are lots of different things. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're hedge funds, they're private equity, they're private real estate, they're private infrastructure, et cetera. But, but taking, taking that aside for a sec, uh, for a second, what, what, they, what they need, one, is um, to defend or protect my assets from inflation. And there are certain types of alternatives like, like private infrastructure, which, which do that. And um, that's true in both um, private direct assets, but it's also true in listed infrastructure securities. Um, and the reason for that is most of the contracts between the infrastructure company and the users of that infrastructure have inflation escalators built in. So as inflation goes up, the cash flows go up. That's a good thing from an investment perspective. So that, that is one specific benefit. The, the other is how do I stay in the market, but minimize my volatility? And um, I don't want to, I don't want to go to cash necessarily. I want to stay invested for the long run. I'm a long, I'm a long-term investor, but I really can't tolerate this liquidity. And it feels like there's nowhere to hide in public markets. It used to be that you could simply go to, to credit and, and, um, and, and have a uh, much, much smoother ride. But obviously given what happened in 22, that what investors learned is that's not always an option. And adding certain alternatives, again, the right kind of alternatives to a portfolio uh, can absolutely uh, smooth that ride or help to help to smooth the ride. And, and, and maybe the, the, the third is managing or matching the liquidity need with, with the type of alternative that you invest in. So if an investor has you know, significant reserves and, and doesn't need uh, uh, liquidity in, in any near-term period, th there is, of course, the concept of the illiquidity premium. So if I lock up my capital for longer, uh, conceptually, the return should be higher. Mm -hmm. And um, and understanding that trade-off is is really important. Whereas the other way, you can invest in alternatives in liquid markets, say liquid or listed infrastructure securities. These are infrastructure mutual fund, um, as an example. Um, you're getting many of the characteristics that I described. You're you're getting inflation protection. You're you're getting lower volatility. You're getting downside protection. You're getting it in, in a in a vehicle that offers daily liquidity, but you're not probably getting that illiquidity premium. And so, understanding that trade off is is really uh, in, important for the advisor to have that conversation with with their client. Yeah, it's. To me, uh, really interesting to see in some research that we've done uh, wealth management through Wealth Management IQ um, and research that I've done over the last you know, five to 10 years uh, that the advisors who are not just more educated about alternatives, but also have more access, if you will, um, or more aware of the tools that they can access are actually growing faster right, than the advisors who are more traditional, let's call it that. Um, I'm curious, and I don't know if you've noticed this at all, you know, even just anecdotally, um, but as you look at the advisors and the RA firms that are more well-versed, right, more conversant in the world of alternatives, are you noticing any difference in their you know, success rate or their growth rates? Yeah, yeah, I, it, it, it's it's an interesting point, and and it, indeed, we we absolutely do, and I think I think it's probably for a a few a few reasons. Long only um, traditional equities, traditional bonds are 
to some degree, and maybe I'm over um, overstating this, but to some degree have become commoditized over over time. The provider you choose, the 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 um, you know sub asset class, the the betas are all very close. Um, the alpha that's generated from um, one manager over another is is not that meaningful. We talk in you know we talk in um, the the hundred basis points, fifty basis points of, of differential between um, two managers in the same asset class, and and that's 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 a meaningful difference over time. But but that means that the advisor is the value that the advisor is is adding if that's all they're doing, so to speak, um, is a bit different than if they're thinking about alternatives and all of the kind of knobs and dials that an advisor has to use. I talked a, a bit about liquidity. I talked about the different kinds of manager, different kinds of strategies in, in the alternative space. Um, but if you also were to study the alpha differential, if you will, the, the difference in return um, from the the top quartile managers to, to lesser quartile managers, you would see a, a tremendous amount of differentiation. So way, way, way more than, than you would see in, in long only um, traditional asset classes. So I, I, I maybe would just put that out there to say the value that the client, that the advisor is having um, in, in those discussions with the client is greater. The other, the other thing that has happened and, and that, that maybe a, a result of, of this is the fact that the conversations that you have with a client when you're thinking about those kinds of trade-offs, liquidity, cash flow needs are, are deeper um, than you might have with, with traditional asset classes. I think you know traditional asset classes, what you end up with oftentimes is that 60-40 portfolio or an 80-20 portfolio or 30-70 portfolio or what, whatever that risk tolerance that the client may have. That's very different from thinking through what, what they need from their total portfolio to include um, to include different types of alternatives. So I, I, I think the, the observation that you make is an excellent one and does bear out, there are probably many other reasons why they may have more successful practices, um, but we certainly see it, um, we, we certainly see it every day with, with the advisors we're engaging with. Those that, are, those that understand the role that alternatives can play in client portfolios are, have deeper relationships and are more successful. The understanding coupled with access, right, is really powerful for those who know how to not only articulate that, right, but obviously put it into practice too. There are very few clients right now who are saying to their advisors, you know, just present me with the same ideas that you've been presenting for the last five to 10 years, right? Yeah. Um, they're looking for new ideas. They're looking for access to new markets and new opportunities. So that actually brings me just to my next question. Now, you've already touched on a couple of the different you know, asset classes or sub-asset classes, if you will. Um, I think alternatives is probably much you know, bigger than uh, uh, most of us, most people can, can really appreciate. Uh, but we, we've heard a lot about you know, real estate, and real assets, in particular, you know, infrastructure. Um, for our listeners who you know, might be thinking about different opportunities in both of those you know, markets or those asset classes right now, can you offer up, and we'll start with real estate, uh, just some top line basic you know, considerations right, when evaluating some opportunities? And all, obviously also, we talked about some of the benefits, but some additional benefits that advisors and their clients might not be aware of or appreciate as much. Sure. Sure. So fo focusing on, on real estate, I, I would say the primary consideration, ju just, like, just like you would think of in, in long only or, or a traditional fund, is the, the manager does matter. The, the scope and sure. scale of the manager matters, especially as I was describing before in, in private assets or alternatives, that, that, that differential in performance is, is, is meaningful. So that's one thing to consider. The, the other thing to consider is the role that this investment would play in a, in a client portfolio. There, there are lots of different types of real estate strategies uh, out there. there. There's everything that ranges from opportunistic real estate. So this, this would be higher returning real estate, generally in the form of a longer locked up um, strategy, in other words, a less liquid strategy that might um, might might have features like capital calls, where the manager is actually 
um, the client's committing to the fund and then the manager's coming back to them on a periodic basis, calling capital as, as they need that, that commitment where they find opportunities. That, that's opportunistic real estate. The, the, there's core plus real estate, which is um, a li little bit lower returning, a um, little bit less risk. There might be less development risk embed embedded in it. There's core real estate, which will be very income oriented, very stabilized, which would generally have uh, a level of liquidity, maybe monthly, maybe quarterly, depending on the, the, the product. And then of course, there's public real estate, which you're investing in the same exact assets. They just happen to be traded in the in the um, in the you know stock stock market or or conceptually the the credit markets. But you you're investing in the same types of assets, different liquidity profile for each, and a different return expectation for each. So the consideration that the investor should be thinking about is. Um, and the, the advisor with the investor should be thinking about is what is the specific role that this is going to play in in my portfolio or my client's portfolio and how do I how do I need um, what, what's my need for liquidity what one thing that I, I do think is important right now or perhaps important in a very timeless way in almost everything we do but real estate maybe is the is is the most is the kind of two things um, that are slightly different from one another. One is the entry point. So when, when is that capital being, quote unquote, put in the ground? Is it being put in the ground at a point of high valuations or low valuations? I think most of your listeners would probably know that real estate is a highly cyclical investment. And, and what that means is those, those cycles often are different in different markets, different sectors, different geographies, but but what is the entry point? So now, you know, sitting here in March of 23 is a very, very, very different entry point than sitting in in um, in in 21 in March, uh, as an example. And so investing in with a real estate manager that is putting money to work at the appropriate time in the appropriate jurisdiction. As an example, most things we do at Brookfield in the real estate uh, market are global. And that gives us the flexibility to deploy capital in certain markets at different times, depending on where we are in that cycl cyclicality, because generally those, those um, supply demand trends move at different paces. So that that's definitely one important consideration. And the other is, in our mind, the manager's ability to, to own and operate the asset. And what I mean by that is, it's one thing to buy an asset and hope it's worth more in the future and then sell that asset. It's, it's another thing to buy an asset, put your own people in that asset, utilize your own knowledge of the real estate market, of running different types of real estate, of owning and operating, as we like to say at Brookfield, um, mm -hmm. those, those assets, that is a, a, a significant differentiator because you have control of the, the value that you're creating as opposed to creating value just with the passage of time. Yeah, I appreciate that because I think most financial advisors understand to some extent real estate um, and how to get their clients some exposure to real estate on some level. Uh, but I don't know that everyone is as aware of the depth and the breadth of the options that you just described. And I can say, you know, we also publish Wealth Management Real Estate, um, which has been integrated into wealthmanagement.com. And some of the stories that we're writing about the real estate markets right now are registering as the most popular stories on our site on wealthmanagement.com. So there's a huge appetite right now for information um, about you know real estate. So thank you, David, just for kind of giving us the state of the state and walking us through it, some of the, the various different options that are available. I also do want to just touch on real assets and infrastructure um, more specifically in, in a little bit of detail as well. This is an area where I think there are a tremendous amount of opportunities, but I don't think that the typical financial advisor you know, is as you know, sort of well-versed as in infrastructure um, as they might be in the more traditional real estate world. Um, so if you're thinking about practical applications, problems that infrastructure can solve for clients, um, what are some basic considerations that you think the typical financial advisor should be aware of? Yeah, yeah. It, infrastructure is a, a, a very interesting asset class. As you point out, individual investors have not historically access to, to true infrastructure assets. And, and it really wasn't until 25, 30 years ago that institutional investors had access 
to true infrastructure assets. Brookfield's been investing in, in infrastructure for 120 years. We, we uh, started very initially with some investments in, in Brazil in the 18, late 1800s and have since built what is what is truly one of the largest uh, infrastructure platforms in, in the world. And one of the reasons that I think infrastructure is an asset class that makes sense for individual investors is some of the things that I mentioned before. So I infrastructure in, in general, and it depends on which sector you're talking about and whatnot, but think of infrastructure as um, the backbone of the economy. It's the roads, it's the airports, it's the data centers, it's the cell phone towers, uh, it's the, the, the pipelines, it's the hydroelectric, it's the stuff that when you, you don't often see, but when you turn your water on uh, in your house or your apartment and it just comes out, it's infrastructure that made that happen. Or you drive your car to work and how do you, how do you get there? You, you drive on a toll road, that's, that's an infrastructure asset. And, and a lot of those assets are privately owned. A lot of those assets are owned in the public markets and, and are listed securities. But, but what's unique about them, many of them, is that uh, the, the cash flows associated with them are contracted. In other words, if, if I own a toll road or a utility of some form or a cell phone tower company, the, the company that's using those, often a government, is contracting with me for a very long period of time, 20, 30, more sometimes years. So the, the, regardless of what's going on in the world, stock market's up, stock market's down, bond market's up, bond market's down, the, the, those cash flows are completely stable. And I alluded to this before, but in most cases, there are also inflation escalators embedded in them. So not only are the cash flows stable, but when the when the inflation is going up, the cash flows are increasing. That that's like almost a magical investment uh, in in a way. And because of the stability of the cash flows, the investments tend to be much much more stable, even in public markets. So infrastructure. Uh, as, a, as an asset class in public markets last year in 2022, we're, we're down roughly half of the broad market. That, that's because of the, the stability of the cash flows, the tangible nature of the assets, um, the fact that they're not, uh, they're not um, the, 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 they have high barriers to entry. And in other words, somebody can't go um, recreate a toll road very easily or recreate a utility the same way they could with a, a um, pharmaceutical uh, company or a consumer products company or th those kinds of things makes them much, much more stable. So stable cash flows contracted, inflation linkage and, and, and downside protection are the characteristics of, of infrastructure. So maybe I'll pause there and I'm happy to talk about access as well because it, it is a challenging uh, asset class to get access to. I think you, what you just described sums up a different angle on you know, what the listeners are probably getting bored of me saying on almost every episode now is that while it is a bear market, um, I really do believe it is a bull market for financial advice. Um, not only is there a greater need for professional financial advice than ever before for a number of reasons, um, but there are also more um, that financial advisors have right than you know, investors have ever really had before as well. Um, so I appreciate you walking through the considerations for infrastructure, because it's exactly the kind of thing that an advisor should be looking at and evaluating you know, pros and cons, obviously, uh, on behalf of their clients. And, and I, I do want to end, I know you want to touch on access as well. So maybe you can address that in the closing remarks here. But you know, for me, one of the challenges with alternatives, is it's constantly evolving. Um, and when you look at institutions, yeah, they have investment departments, depending on the size of the institutional investor, that could be 10, 20, 50, 100 people. And RIA may be a lot smaller than that. Um, so what are, if you could give our listeners some guidance, some advice, what are some recommendations that you have for making sure that you're not only staying educated and aware of what's available, but that you have some understanding around the timing and the practical application of it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it, it is, it's an interesting um it's an interesting dilemma because as you point out, there are more options than, than ever, but, but with, with that increases complexity and increases the challenge of, of as, you, as you say, staying educated. 
you know, one one interesting approach, and it's and it's um, something that that we have have utilized with with certain um, institutional investors who don't have the staff that you that you described. They might have a smaller staff, or their staff might be focused on on other markets. And we use this approach with um, certain uh, RIAs as well. It, it is utilize a, a multi asset portfolio so that you don't have to pick. Is it core plus? Is it value add? Is it core? Is it real estate? Is it infrastructure? What's expensive now? What's cheap now? And utilize a multi-asset approach that does it all for you. You know, you think about a balanced mutual fund. That that is what a balanced mutual fund does, of course, is, is the portfolio managers making a lot of decisions on your behalf. And that can be a great core investment. And then you can invest. Um, from a satellite perspective around that as, as, as people do with, with balanced mutual funds or, or the like, um, fi find somebody who has that kind of um, multi-asset strategy. Um, it's something we do in the credit space, um, which is an incredibly complex market to think about public credit, private credit, sponsored, not sponsored, um, you know, uh, securitized credit, et cetera. Outsource that. And let let a leader in, in the market do it. It's something we do in the real asset space across real estate and infrastructure. Out, outsource that and 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 let let a market leader do that for you. And um, and then perhaps that's a great way to get your clients educated. It's a great way for them to understand the beginnings of private markets. And then you can do more narrow or satellite uh, um, investments along the side, as as I described. Um, in terms of staying educated, it, it, it's it's hard. I, I'll, I'll maybe make a, a plug for the podcast here. Um, these kinds of things are are great ways to 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 stay informed. I, I, not to make a shameless plug for ourselves, but but feel free to call um, us at, at Brookfield Oak Tree Wealth Solutions. Um, th this is something we're we're really passionate about to to increase. The use of alternatives, as I described at the beginning, from 3% to something um, more than that, which we think is important for client outcomes. The, the best way to do that is we, as the asset management industry, not just we as a firm, but we as an industry, owe it to our clients and owe it to our partners uh, as financial advisors uh, to help educate. And, and we're, we're always happy to have a conversation, even if it has nothing to do with anything that, that, that we're offering, but instead is, is, um, is just background information. Uh, we feel like it's our duty and, and, and frankly, our honor to do that. I appreciate that, Dave. And you, you definitely hit on, as I mentioned at the beginning of the, the podcast here, a lot of very timely and important you know, topics and issues uh, for our audience here today. We've been talking about you know, alts for years right, in the wealth space, but there does seem to be this tipping point, right? And I don't know if that means that billions or even trillions of assets will start to flow into alternatives, but there does seem to be more engagement around it um, than at any point I can remember over the last you know, decade or so. Um, so David, thank you for stopping by the podcast to share your thoughts and to help you know, educate our audience, not just around what's available, but also how they can access it. So David, thank you for being as nimble as you've been with a lot of <laughs> very complex information. Yeah, th thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. And thank you to your listeners for, for listening. Uh, but I enjoyed it. Yeah, this was fun, timely and important. And we'll have to make it a point to circle back and have you on maybe in six to 12 months, right? Just to see how things have evolved, how things have changed. And we'll be sure to obviously keep our listeners you know, aware of all the different developments across the alternative investment landscape. So on behalf of the wealth management team at Informa, I'm Mark Bruno. Thank you everybody for stopping by and listening to today's episode of the RA Edge podcast. Thanks everyone. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. 
The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.